I'm your host tonight. I'm Christian Lehman, longtime universe attendant. It was my greatest accomplishment to get to stand up for the first time at 10 years when John Jordan asked, how many times have you been here? Uh, <laughs> so it's probably the thing that I have stuck with more than I've stuck with anything else in my life is Dickens and my friendship with all of you. And so it's a very special opportunity to get to be here. I'm in Cleveland, which is in Ohio on Lake Erie. And in preparation for today, or as I'm reading it, I also have the penguin to write in. But then I also have a reprint of all of the monthly numbers. So I'm reading it in that way as well to get a sense of the, the smallness of the paper. And then I also have a first edition that I'm using for looking especially at the illustrations is where that's like highly valuable. So I am, surrounded by Pickwickiana, because I also have a deck of playing cards that are about Pickwick, which I picked up from a PPP purchase there, when a silent auction there, for anybody that's been to the universe, it's a, you have a beer and you bid on stuff, and it's a great way to spend your life. And I'm also drinking out of a mug featuring Mrs. Bardell falling into the arms of Pickwick. And what's really great is I've owned this for seven years now, um, but I had read Pickwick before that and now getting to reread it and surround myself with increasingly more Dickensiana that I have, it's uh, pretty amazing. So in general, um, kind of my plan for the next hour and a half that we have is I'll tend to spend a little bit of time at the beginning. I'm going to share a PowerPoint and talk through some of the genesis of Pickwick Papers and really focus on the idea of illustrations as well, because that's a, one of the passions of mine. Uh, but just as an introduction, one of the reasons why I wanted you all to show your books was we should all be reading in different ways, right? We're, some of us are listening to it and we're getting the orality of it and really celebrating like the way Dickens can put words in our ears but others are looking at it visually. And so for those of us that are seeing it visually, our interpretation of jingle, for instance, is going to be very different from somebody that's listening to it because the reader has to convey those dashes, whereas on the page, Dickens shows us the dashes. And so what I wanna really kind of celebrate today is that we're all approaching it from different positions. Some that are squinting to look at things, some that are enlarging the text, making it interactive. This is one of the great joys uh, I love Vicky's story about stealing her book by accident. It's a very Pickwickian story. It's this kind of thing that would happen by accident of you stuff something somewhere and then later on it emerges in a manuscript and gets enfolded into like the novel of her life. And now because she shared her story with us, we all connect with her that way. And in some ways that's how Pickwick Papers really operates. It's on this idea of shared stories being that the basis of both friendship and swindling. And so in a lot of ways it is um, the power of storytelling. So I'm going to share my screen if I can, yep. And uh, can you see a PowerPoint on your screens if you have a screen? Yep, excellent. Okay, yes, so, yep. yes, right, great. yes. So the I wanted to subtitle this is just, um, Pickwick Papers as an appetitive novel, right? Just you'll recognize the word appetite inside of there. Because um, this is a novel obsessed with consumption from brandy to foods, to stories, to experience. Uh, it just, it's full of life and devouring and almost it's non-judgmental in what it will consume. And then also what it regurgitates for us to see. And so it's this like wonderful energy, almost this caloric burn that we're engaged in as we read through this. Um, so here in Cleveland, and I'm sure many of you have something similar, the name Pickwick appears all over. So downtown Cleveland has the Pickwick and Frolic uh, restaurant and general experience. So it's like a comedy club. Um, 
but it was wild to me, right? I, I show up here not expecting anything related to Dickens and suddenly I'm walking down the street and sure enough, there's a Pickwick in my new hometown. And uh, I'm sure you all have your own experience of maybe encountering a Pickwick in an unexpected place because even in his afterlife, he still sure is getting around. Um, this is the sentence that makes me love the Pickwick Papers. And one of the things I like about it is it's, I, I don't think anybody would have been able to guess, um, but it's the narrator who in this is being structured as an editor, which um, we can talk about in a little bit. But he says simply, the narrator, we cannot state the precise nature of the thoughts which passed through Mr. Trotter's mind, because we do not know what they were. And so what I love about this is uh, Dickens' use of that editorial we, which creates this kind of extended voice, and that mixture of, we can't state the precise nature, but why that extra word of, of precise, right? It's this desire for expertise and um, guarantee, but then it's also uh, uh, an admitted failure of getting there. And uh, um, you then hit that comma and everything collapses because we do not know what they were, right? We don't have access to this, we've lost it. So in addition to this being a novel that's full of stories that get related, it's full of stories that are lost. And here there's a little bit of like, almost melancholy with um, papers that have been written, they'll get something spilled on them and you can't read it anymore. Or somebody that's taking notes gets so drunk that he can't read his handwriting. And so it's simultaneously a novel that celebrates the precision of the written word and also what gets lost in that. And so the other thing that I like here is the author's desire to wanna to write things down and make it clear versus this idea that Mr. Trotter is keeping it in his mind and that's where it's a secret. And then the in-between space there is oral culture, the kind of like Jingles and Sam Wellers that we have. And so this is one of the ways that I really love reading this book is thinking about how am I getting this information? Is it a story that's accidental? Is it a story that's uh, deliberate? Is it manipulative? Is it um, ideological? Is it humorous? Um, and all of those obviously interconnect as well. So the next slide is going to be pretty chaotic and I will try to explain to you what we're looking at when we see it. Nope, that's not it yet. First, we have a very clear letter that Dickens wrote. <laughs> In mid-April of 1836, he writes to an old publisher of his, Macrone. And so he was writing under Macrone. He was writing the sketches under Macrone. And then he switches to Chapman and Hall for Pickwick Papers. And Macrone's kind of bummed about this because he's like, Dickens, you know, he could make some money off of Dickens maybe. And then at the very end, Dickens leaves a PS and says, I wish you would let me have two bosses, one for the commissary and one for myself. I want the hints on etiquette too, period, all caps, Pickwick triumphant. So Dickens is declaring, my new book is going great. And this is an awesome letter. When you look at the date, which is of April 36. And uh, um, this is what's happening in April of 36 with Pickwick Papers. The print run went from 1,000 in March to 500. They halved the print run because they only sold 400 copies of Pickwick in its first appearance. So Dickens is saying, hey, it's a great, Pickwick's triumphant, but nobody's really reading Pickwick at that moment. And this is, um, a lot of different things are happening that I'm gonna try to weave together and talk about. So pick, um, Sketches by Bose got published in an, uh, one volume in February of 36. So then when people pick up the front of our book, it says um, edited by Bose. And so people are seeing that his name is there. So he starts Pickwick. Chapters one and two come out and they come out with a fellow named Seymour as the illustrator. So this is kind of gonna get us into the idea of the genesis of the novel. You'll see that that should definitely say four illustrations, not four pages. So Seymour had four illustrations and Dickens was supposed to supply 24 pages of text. He actually wrote 26, so he went over, but he's do he does that. 
So the way this Pickwick Papers was first designed was Dickens was approached and the publisher said, hey, Seymour, this really famous artist, wants you to write just kind of like text that fills in um, the main purpose of this publication, which is these illustrations by Seymour. So it was meant basically to just be a narrative that gets you from picture to picture. And sort of what happens, of course, is that Dickens is going to make it so that the pictures kind of like um, lose some of their emphasis. So in April, Seymour commits suicide after having finished three of the four illustrations. And Dickens then has to like, they have to, they're scrambling, they need to find a new illustrator. And we're gonna, we're gonna look at some of these illustrations next. And so that's partly why I wanna make sure you, you're aware of this, because this is very chaotic. These first four months, right? He's declaring Pickwick is triumphant. His illustrator is dead. They're scrambling to find another one. He's barely making copy. Um, so they find a fellow named Bus, and he is not very satisfactory. They don't like him so much. But what else Dickens has done here in May is he renegotiates his contract. So he wants more money. And he's now writing 32 pages. So it's unlikely you probably you notice this when you're reading, like unless you're reading in the kind of installment style like this, because you can feel the difference in the pages. They get heavier. And everything though changes in probably the most significant month of, <laughs> this is so elaborate, I'm just gonna say it. Whatever, I'll say another um, superlative later on. But June, 1836, the most significant month of Charles Dickens's life. Um, Pickwick, installment four comes out. Fizz is the new illustrator, Havelot Knight Brown, and the character of Sam Weller is introduced. At this point on, this becomes the most popular work of uh, fiction being sold serially. So in February of 37, right, a year later, there's 14,000 copies that are sold, 20,000 by May, by September, 26,000. And then a few weeks after the last installment was out, over 40,000. So the only comparison like I can really come up with is the number of people, like if any of you watched the finale of MASH in 86, right? So the finale of MASH is the most watched television program that's not a Super Bowl of all time. 50 million people tuned in to watch it. Um, and so that's kind of like a comparison that you can maybe do to Pickwick. All right, so that's just been a lot of information thrown at you. So let's look at some pictures. Oh, sorry, I forgot I had this one. Um, this is just quickly thinking about why was it so popular? And so here's a couple different people that have thoughts about this. Um, and I know we have another very accomplished Pickwickian in the audience, at least one, we probably have more. Um, so Patton, who many of you have probably met at um, the Dickens universe, uh, suggests three things with this idea of the serial reading that Dickens is doing, writing a story um, that's unfolding. It establishes a habit among the readers, he says, because like you're seeing it, it gets advertised and it's like, oh, here comes the new month, I'm gonna get the new Dickens. Um, multiple people are reviewing it. And so it creates um, a topical conversation that everybody can talk about. So this fits into like if um, any of you were part of a workplace where people were talking about Game of Thrones as it was coming out, this idea of zeitgeist. Um, and another one is advertisements. So starting also in that fourth number, um, they started putting in all sorts of like ads that you could look at to be like, oh, this thing's being sold, this thing's being sold. And so that starts getting you more money and generates more revenue. Um, and then they also just put in other inserts. And then uh, Robert Douglas Fairhurst, he suggests though, oh, and what else adds to this is it's cheap. This thing costs one shilling, which I think is like the price of a glass of gin. Paper is cheaper at this point in the thirties. There's new printing technology and there's really efficient distribution access points. So essentially like what's happening is like Dickens comes along at the same time as like the technology that we might equate with like Amazon and Netflix being out. Like anything that's come before is completely outmoded. And Dickens is here at the right time to be like this new streaming service, I get it. I'm gonna make it about me. The public wants to consume things in this way. Um, so we'll come back to that sentence one in this a little bit. So let's look at some illustrations here. 
And maybe we can get some of you guys talking and sharing with um, what you see. So these are Robert Seymour's first two illustrations of Pickwick. And let's um, zoom in here. So just, yeah, if you wanna uh, share what you see, right? If this were your impression, you're opening this book, this is the illustration, you would see it first because the illustrations appear at the beginning. Um, and so anybody wanna share what stands out to them? Well, I can certainly see that the gentleman on the chair is commanding everyone's attention. Do you want to make a guess as to who that gentleman is? Oh, well, I'm pretty sure that's Samuel Pickwick. <laughs> yeah. uh, I didn't want to spoil anything. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Everything we can go, anything up to chapter 19 is good to talk about. Well, if I hadn't, if I didn't know that it was a comic book, I would think that it's very serious because they look like he's pontificating on something very important, which he is in his mind. I would not think that I was going to be laughing throughout the novel. Yeah, that's really great. Um, like this grumpy, yeah, the people here. Excellent. What else do people see? Well, on, on, on what you just mentioned, there, there's only one naysayer, and that is the grumpy man in the corner, which, which is, I mean, he, he's the, the person who speaks out and then gets essentially shouted down in, in the novel. Yeah, Mr. Blotton. So this is a fun thing to do. Uh, when you have the books and the illustrations is try to identify figures and be like, oh, did any map on? Who's doing the action in the book? Who's not? It's always quite fun. Uh, so one of the geniuses I think about Pickwick, what makes is he's instantly recognizable, right? These tights and his glasses, like every time he appears, he's, it's like playing Where's Waldo in the easiest version of Where's Waldo <laughs> because he <laughs> jumps out right away. Uh, so some things here that point to the early genesis of the novel is these are sports people, right? Like you see the billiard thing there. Um, I think these are guns. So it was initially supposed to be about like city people going and trying to behave like country people and doing sports stuff. Uh, which major portion of the population is missing here? Women. Women. Yeah. And so this is something I'm going to be interested in talking about um, throughout today is how Pickwick uses humor and women and mixes those together. And if you find it funny or if you don't, um, if it's difficult, it's a, definitely a question because this book is very interested in like men talking to men about manly things, which include talking about women. So it's the, the gender politics of it, I think, are really interesting for our day and age. Right, so that's Seymour's first one. Here is his illustration of the stroller's tale. And this fits, I think, maybe it was, Melody, you were the one talking about not knowing it's funny. Um, does this look like it's, are, you, are we continuing our? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this story, just to remind you, is about um, an actor who's out of work and is dying of alcoholism. He beats his wife and his child. Um, so the person earlier that was talking about it was nice to be outside of Nickleby. <coughs> There's some moments when we're really in the midst of some of that dark Dickens. And it generally is in these stories. Um, yeah, so here's a happier days when he was an actor and things. Uh, so this is Seymour style. And let's look, so then Seymour dies and they replace him with bus and these illustrations, it's likely you might not have, seen. one of these appears pretty often, but the other one doesn't. So I'm also gonna, I'm curious about, some, um, look at some of this style, hold that in your brain for a second. And now we're gonna shift modes to bus. Oh no, that's sorry. This is, uh, I keep on not knowing where my slides are going. This is the third one. Uh, this is the third Seymour. So there's a signature down there. And here we finally have Melody humor. 
that's my favorite thing of all time is that hat chasing because I've been there and done that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like to me, it, it's so reminiscent of like Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin, this physical humor. And when you're reading it, it just jumps off the page as he's chasing down that hat. And, um, and this is fun because this is like, we're in the audience here because we're all looking at Pickwick doing this. And so like we, get, we kind of get to join in the, the chaos of the crowd, which is, I think this is part of the generosity of Dickens is it really lets you as a reader feel like um, you're with the other people here and you're just as individual as this fellow with the wild hair and his hat off or this lady in her parasol or me up climbing the tree. <laughs> <laughs> really good, yeah, it gives everybody a space. Okay, so now on to bus. Yeah, see more better. So what do you, uh, what do you, what do you think about bus? Would you, would you fire him? Heartless. <laughs> <laughs> Sita, really interesting. Yeah. Can you say something more about the heart? Well, just as an observer, there's nothing coming from the faces of that two. They're in such close proximity. And yes, it looks like there's a funny thing that's happened and there's a fat little boy there. But um, it's there, it just belies the closeness of their um, faces to see their faces in such solitary attitudes. Well, hmm. and he, he, he's she's he's, uh, shocked. She's shocked, and uh, he's uh, disgusted. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it actually represents what happened at that moment pretty well oh, in terms of each each of those three people were, you know, they had their own self-interest at that moment as their priority. You know, nice. Joe's busting them. He's caught. You know, this is a serious um, action that he's taken. She's afraid her, um, her uh, reputation has been besmirched. <laughs> And um, so I thought it, it hewed very well to the, to the activity described by, by Charles. Uh, I think so too, but I don't, the artistry is, is good. It's no, I agree with that. The appeal, it's not as appealing to look at as right. singing, or of course, Fizz is coming up. It, you know, it's just <laughs> yes. like, just fire. Uh, it's true, yeah, when you, when you know we're going to, we are going to Fizz and we just came from Seymour. Yeah, yeah this is very yeah. journeyman. He did, because this, again, all this new technology that they're using, they're doing what's called steel etching on these plates. And so Bust doesn't really have the experience to do some things. Um, Get it right. Out, uh, so this, you might not be able to see, he has her, his hand wrapped around her waist. Mm -hmm. um, I see it. So it's quite, quite scandalous, like in some ways, like mm -hmm. what they're showing, like, because in the, in the story it's scandalous, but then also to like represent it in the image. Um, and then here we have, it's scary. The cricket game. So this that's, one, I don't really. <laughs> that's very crude. Yeah. Uh, I mean, crudely done. And the earlier image, I was just thinking uh, somehow Seymour, when we first meet uh, Pickwick and, and all of them, they're ludicrous, but in a way lovable. And here you just see grotesque. Or so yeah. it seems to me. Yeah, I think thinking about that word grotesque is really interesting. He doesn't look like he he doesn't look like he had his heart in it. There's so much more of background and not so much of the characters. So it takes your attention away from the characters. Yeah. Think that how old was Seymour when he uh, died? Uh, I I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Um, but not, he was not an old man. Uh, I mean, all right, so now, of course, we are going to go to the great collaborator, How About Night Brown, who comes blazing onto the scene. So let's uh, take a look here. 
beautiful. For those of you that like have been to many of the universes and if you have the penguin and you've read this, like you turn to a fizz illustration, you, like you recognize the long kind of gangly legs, like it just, it's fond. It's like if you walk into a favorite room in a museum and it's like they have a work by an artist you know, but it's not one that you like you were familiar with and it's just like, wow, it feels good. Like I look at a fizz and it just makes me feel good. Um, yep. I've not, of course, a great moment for Pickwick here. <laughs> As uh, we have Jingle successfully running away, absconding with his future bride, who will not be a future bride any long. Uh, any hot guesses as to who uh, Pickwick is in this picture? <laughs> <laughs> he's the one it's happening to. He's, he's, the, one, he's the one who needs help. He's, he's the one with the gigantic head. <laughs> um, I want to highlight two things that were just, actually all three were great. Um, he's the one things are happening to, is awesome, and uh, he's the one who needs help. And then he's the one with the big head. So we can start with the third point there. He's the one with the big head. Like he's always going to stand out because his body is recognizable immediately. And he has a big head both in illustrations, but also in like, he, like self-absorbed in his own head. Um, this idea that he's the one that always needs help. He's hapless. And one of the things that I think this novel really challenges us is how cute should we find that helplessness and his constant need for help versus like, like, is the world malicious because Pickwick needs help? Or is Pickwick not learning how to live in the world that he should, in the way he should? Uh, and then that passivity of that first comment, he's the one things are happening to. Like, as we go through this novel, like, things that happen to Pickwick. Well, you know, Christian, it's because he's always generously out there letting things happen to him, you know? And, and the funny thing is, in these 19 chapters and onward, I assume, He's always so esteemed. He's such a important figure um, with all these adjectives and accolades, you know, and yet we see him in trouble all the time. So funny. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Let's look at this one over here on the right because, um, so one thing we can say, um, I just, actually I'll zoom back. If you notice the complete absence of background work and etching, here in bus. And then both with Seymour, like look, like the ability to put paintings on the back wall or doing everything with this drape, nothing like that with bus. And then uh, like this extraordinary work with the tree and the, the inn here. It's mm, galleries. Yeah. So here we're introduced to some of our favorites. And I'm curious, I want to hear your guys' thoughts of your first impressions about Sam Weller when you do, first- Do you know if they were all using the same steel etching process? Um, from what I understand, it's both Seymour and Fizz are, and then uh, like Bus was trying to. Yeah, his are, his are, are much con more contrasty and there's less layering and smoothness, very chunky. Yeah, so it seems to me like there's a, ch a change in technology. And actually Fizz is going to be really important for this because he was going to invent a whole new etching style for Bleak House. So Bleak House has these plates that are called the dark plates where like Fizz and his ex, so like, one of the things about Fizz and Dickens working together is they both challenge each other to get better at their cra individual crafts and kind of weave them together. So that's one of the reasons why I wanna like, cause this way, as you keep reading now, especially if it's a penguin, pay attention to the illustrations and um, what's there. So here's Fizz, it's not Fizz, here is, Sam Weller. Yeah. Is anybody in love with Sam Weller? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd certainly like, if he wanted to kiss me down in the coal cellar, you bet. I'd let him buy me a drink. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I, I love uh, Sam Weller too. It strikes me it's how interesting he is partly inspired by Sancho Panza in Don Quixote, but he's very different from Sancho. And uh, that's just really remarkable, I think, that Dickens could make this wonderful change in the sidekick as he does. Yeah. I want to say about Sam Weller, well, I encountered Pickwick Papers about the same time my parents took me to see 
uh, Henry the Fourth Part One. And so I, I've been thinking about this a lot in my mind. Falstaff and Sam Weller and Mr. Jingle are all kind of linked together as these characters that just are unlike anything I had ever encountered in my life. And it was instant rapture. I, it's not too strong a word. I just loved. I still remember the delight. And, you know, that was 70 years ago. Mm -hmm. the, the interesting thing about the Fizz illustrations is you can always, you can often, if not always, sort of tell the personality of the character by the drawing. I mean, there's really yeah. something very unique. And so looking at this, you can see that Sam's going to be somebody that you're going to be happy to travel with, that he's fun, that he's probably has a sense of humor. Um, and it's, it, it really sort of, just the illustration by itself sort of gives you a sense of who this guy is. That, that's right, Tom. And you know, he's not very servile for a servant. No. <laughs> and and, and this, even in this drawing, you can see that, right? Yeah. He's, yeah. Tall. Yeah, he's <laughs> not spelling and scraping at all. Right. He's, he's his own person. That's what makes it so cool. Yeah. And even like with the hat, like he, he wears it at that jaunty angle versus like these two fellows with their hats. Um, yeah. And like, look, there's Pickwick kind of putting his finger to his chin, um, making the observations, but they're as far apart as they can be. But it's almost like their eye contact is being made right here at this moment, too, getting that Sancho Quixote connection that. Um, yeah. Mentioned. And he had the wisdom to hire him, although he kind of goofs up a lot. He has a lot of wisdom, too. Uh, yeah, um, and so there's uh, all three next to each other, just um, quickly as a reminder. Uh, so we looked at that Fat Boy illustration, and interestingly, Dickens had Fizz redo that one. Oh. So we can actually oh. do a, a comparison between oh. Bus and Fizz. Much better. <laughs> So was it used in later editions or? Yes, yep. And so oh. um, the the Penguin produces this one by Fizz. It doesn't reproduce bus. One of the things I love about Dickens is the way in which he makes believable people. The characters of the people in the story are brilliant. And actually this illustration also demonstrates how the, the artist could find that and project it in his picture. Right. It's, it's interesting to compare the two illustrations because to me, the characters come out very differently. In the, the Fizz illustration, they actually look shocked. Um, they look angry in the Seymour illustration. And the, the boy has some attitude in the, in the Fizz illustration. And he's just sort of like there in the Seymour illustration. Mm -hmm. It's more 3D. Yeah, um, so somebody was talking about, maybe, I forget who, that this seemed malicious almost, or mm -hmm. lacking heart. Does this, do you think that Fizz is maybe less malicious or has heart? Or yeah, I think a little, there's, there's a little more playfulness there, I think. Yeah. It doesn't look threatening. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Right, like the, the horror that we see here mm -hmm. on the spinster <clears throat> versus aunt versus here. She just um, looks startled. Yeah. The, there's a nice little touch in the foreground, uh, an upset tree, I guess. It's in a little pot and it's been upset. <laughs> and it, it's all they all they seem so vulnerable the couple mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah and it's amazing what they decide like because obviously you know they they talk about the watering can that gets knocked down and so it's kind of an astonishing moment where you can compare two people um looking at these two images and i know some of you are reading uh, like the oxford Cla world classics or others that have later illustrators or different illustrators. Like you can see, I don't know if they use this scene, but like it becomes competitive in a way of, I'm gonna take this well-known scene, I'm gonna draw it in my own way to show you my Dickens. In the same way, in a lot of like, Dickens is writing against 
other writers that are like, you know, he's writing against the idea of master um, servant pairings, like the wise fool mm -hmm. idea. Yeah. Hmm. Well, Christian, with all your knowledge, this is clearly one of the most best uh, collaborations in all of artistry, isn't it? I mean, these two people, Fizz and Dickens. Uh, I think that a lot of Dickens' success is probably is owed to Fizz, but I think also Dickens wouldn't have become the novelist he does without Fizz. Yeah, so it's just an incredible collaboration. Um, all right, so that's been fun with images. Uh, let's look at some a sentence though, some some Dickensian prose, and so I'm going to go back to a sentence that I find extraordinary. This is from Chapter Two. Mr. Tubman looked round him. The wine, which had exerted its somniferous influence over Mr. Snodgrass and Mr. Winkle, had stolen upon the senses of Mr. Pickwick. That gentleman had gradually passed through the various stages which precede the lethargy produced by dinner and its consequences. He had undergone the ordinary transitions from the height of conviviality to the depth of misery, and from the depth of misery to the height of conviviality. <laughs> like a gas lamp in the street with the wind and the pipe, he had exhibited for a moment an unnatural brilliancy, then sank so low as to be scarcely discernible. After a short interval, he had burst out again to enlighten for a moment, yeah. then flickered with an uncertain staggering sort of light and then gone out altogether. His head was sunk upon his bosom and perpetual snoring with a partial choke occasionally were the only audible indications of the great man's. The great man. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I'd love to hear what you guys see in this, but I want to I want to talk about it for a little bit while you like process it. Um, this idea of the great man, Cindy, that's awesome because they just finished comparing him to a gas lamp, and then <laughs> oh, no, the work, no, of this, work of this simile is just extraordinary. Um, well, no matter what happens, he's always great or estimable, or I mean, he's always <laughs> just the best. <laughs> that's true. Um, so this is uncannily captures this moment. Like if you've ever seen a candle winking. Or the gas lamp, like, and then to pair it, like that, that idea of light, to pair that next to somebody like falling asleep from being kind of drunk. And, but like, you know, you've probably had this experience. If you've ever been around me at Dickens Universe, you've had this experience. It's like, uh, oh, wait, I'm participating. And he was like, oh, <laughs> you gotta like drift and then you jump back in when something excites you. And you you're the very embodiment of it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but then it's a very urban simile. That's the other thing that I think is really important about this, right? Like Dickens as urban novelist. Like this is, the simile is not taken from the countryside. This is taken from walking up and down the streets of London um, and then applying it. So this is the kind of moment where I just, you, you can see Dickens working, but it's effortless how that work is there. So like it's easy to just pass over this and it's by, by stopping and uh, sitting with it, that well, something stands and out. Yeah. If I could say one more thing, Christian, he, he, he's so eloquent about a laugh out loud uh, situation. I mean, so in all the writers that we all read and love, you know, say for over 150 years, everybody can't be really funny and really eloquent at the same time. I think that's a really apt summary of that. Yeah. Um, um, Christian. Yeah, Nora. Um, you know, this phrase with the wind in the pipe. So that means that the the gas is going up and down um, just naturally. I mean, you know, it's, it's serendipitous, right? Nobody's controlling it's going up and down. Uh, that, that's how I understand it, yes. Right, okay. Yeah. So that's like him. He's not in control of his situation. He's, he's, he's the, the lethargy or the animation is happening to him. He's not the author of it. Yeah, and that fits in a really exciting way to those previous comments about things happen to him. He needs help, right? Like, yeah, I love identifying that, like almost that passivity that's there. Um, well, you know, when I think of a gas lamp in the street, you, in my, the image in my mind is a 
sturdy flame, not a brilliant, not a blinding flame, but a sturdy flame. So when he then goes on to uh, explain or to describe the flickering and the bursting of the pipe is that the gas is coming up, sputtering at times and, and free flowing at times. That's a perfect, um, it's very apt to describe Pickwick, um, you know, dozing when, off. When we got our first house, we had gas still in the, as a light, you could light the gas there. Um, and uh, it it flickers. It doesn't it doesn't hold straight like a candle does. It comes out differently. Ah, okay, so, perfect. Yeah, it sort of has air in it. So, and they'd have people who used to light the lamps. Oh, that's with it. With wind in the street. With, with yeah. wind in the pipe means air. God means yeah. air in the pipe. Oh, yes. God. What, what's it. great about this is it connects to the snoring later on because if you like think about the pipe being your like your throat and your wind pipe out. yes exactly <laughs> so it's like yeah gosh exactly Sita amazing amazing <laughs> um and this is the wonderful thing right this is all like I at the Dickens universe um I lead a session every day and this is what, what we do we sit with passages and things like that Sita come out um another one like look at all these different words for like sight and um, various things, but enlighten a very easy pun of both to like explain something because he like pops awake and he talks, but also it's like he's in the middle of this simile of being a light and he's always a sun. I mean, it's just. Oh. Very, good. very good. Negative, uh, the uns that are there. Oh, stunning. Yeah. So good job, Dickens. <laughs> oh. uh, all right. So. I want to talk briefly about Sam Weller. A lot of you probably know this term, but it, it exists around the language of um, Sam Weller. That's a Wellerism. So I just want to talk um, briefly about the introduction of Sam Weller, and then we'll look at a Wellerism. This is from chapter 10. And we've already seen the illustration for this. It was in the yard of one of these inns, of no less celebrated a one than the White Hart, that a man was busily employed in brushing the dirt off a pair of boots early on the morning succeeding the events narrated in the last chapter. He was habited in a coarse striped waistcoat with black calico sleeves and blue glass buttons, drab breeches and leggings. A bright red handkerchief was wound in a very loose and unstudied style around his neck, and an old white hat was carelessly thrown on one side of his head. There were two rows of boots before him, one cleaned and the other dirty, and at every addition he made to the clean row, he paused from his work and contemplated its results with evident satisfaction. So one of the things that I love about this is nothing stands out here. Dickens has introduced a million characters this way and would continue to. What changes though, is when Sam Weller talks. And so the maid says this person wants the boots and he gets going. Well, you are a nice young woman for a musical party you are, said the boot cleaner. Look at these here boots, 11 pair of boots and one shoe as belongs to number six with the wooden leg. The 11 boots is to be called at half past eight and the shoe at nine. Who's number 22? That's to put all the others out. No, no, regular rotation as Jack Ketch said, then he tied the men up. Sorry to keep you waiting, sir but I'll attend to you directly. <laughs> um, so this pattern, which you've probably been picking up, um, saying a common phrase like regular rotation and then adding uh, like or as to create a, 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 a quotation that he attributes to somebody in a peculiar situation. Um, these are called Wellerisms, this style. In the 19th century, you could find people doing these things all over the place because it became massively popular. It's similar if a movie has ever come out with an easy to mimic voice. For instance, when Borat came out, everybody was going around using their Borat voice or anything similar. Uh, it's that kind of phenomenon. Um, and this is when things change. So one of the things to point out with the Wellerism is they're often very dark. 
right? So this one, he's just sitting here talking about like boots, but then he makes this quotation about Jack Ketch, who is the 17th century hangman uh, of London and of uh -huh. England when he tied the men up. So it's talking about hanging people. So it's like he's comparing or he's using this moment. And so it creates bathos. It's like deliberately um, humorous, misapplied humor, but it also has to do with death and uh, like abuse. And so a lot of his comments will do that. And so it's one of the ways like where this novel puts its dark energy is into these Wellerisms and into those side stories that we encounter. So um, got a couple, I think I have one more. Yeah. Uh, Christian, Christian, I have a quick, two quick questions. One is, is do we, um, as uh, Weller's always talking about Venn and, you know, Vittles and all that. Is he German or Dutch or is there a reason for that pronunciation, number one? And number two, this is so dumb. I just figured out that Sam Weller has the same first name as Samuel Pickwick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so about the first one, he's Cockney. So he and his dad oh, okay. speak Cockney accent. Um, and um, I think in a second, we should open up your second point to everybody to discuss. Well, that idea of the, the iterative name is an exciting one that I want, I'd rather hear everybody else's thoughts on. So we'll, um, that'll be the first question when I kind of finish this little presentation that we'll okay. open. So everybody start thinking about Sam and Sam um, and maybe same inside of Sam. So interpolated tales, uh, you've encountered these already. So in our reading for today, we had <laughs> five of them. It's one of one. <laughs> Oh, bless you. Um, so we have the Stroller's Tale, right? Um, the story of the convict's return, a madman's manuscript, the bagman's story, and the parish clerk. Um, I'm not going to look at any of those, but I want you to be aware, like this is a, a way in which the novel is constructed is through these things. But you'll notice in the first 17 chapters, um, we have five of them. And we're only a third of the way through the novel. There's only four more, and they take the rest of the novel. And there's none of these in kind of the end. And so one of the ways to think about as this novel getting constructed is Dickens abandoning certain styles and ideas from the, the beginning and kind of going in a different direction. And so you can actually feel this. You can, it's, it's a flavor to the book that like when you can look at the distribution, it kind of draws attention to it. So you all, what we read for this week, these first 19 chapters is all about discovery. Pickwick is discovering these people. We're discovering Pickwick and Dickens is discovering what the novel is that he's working on which is also kind of like why the introduction of Sam Weller is so uh, important. And the other big thrust is of course, uh, Mrs. Bardell. That lawsuit is gonna be the other thing that gives us the, the frame of this story. Um, do I wanna talk about this? No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Cause I wanna, I wanna open it up, but so I'm gonna actually stop sharing so we can just have a discussion for a little bit about, and let's do names. Um, Sam and Sam, what are your guys' thoughts? Well, I think for one thing, it's that master and servant relationship. I've noticed so far that it's always Mr. Pickwick or Sir from Sam, and it's always, hey, Sam, stop that from mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Pickwick. Yeah. Yeah. Is, 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 is Pickwick ever referred to as Sam, or is he always Samuel? I, th I think of him as Samuel, not as Sam. I, I do as well. Um, Vicky, is that a hand? Yes. Um, the additional words when he's saying stuff and then a few more words, that denotes class. And that's how you know that he's working class because those extra bits are, you know, the English, as you know, certainly are very aware of class. And it was important to establish at the beginning that Sam was not an equal to the other men who are going to be going everywhere and doing weird things. Sam is, is the person who will support them because he is the servant and not on a different status. Well, also I think Sam is the competent half. Oh, yeah. He's the un incompetent half. Yes, yes, absolutely. He's got his head, you know, firmly on the ground. 
Okay. Yeah, even though even though Pickwick has probably more education, Sam is actually smarter and brighter than his master, so to speak. But um, Kristen, I, I I can't figure out why Dickens did it if we're supposed to be figuring that out. Um, well, I, I don't think I don't I think, think it's Moira, too easier. And I mean, he could have had another name, but he didn't. Yeah, so I think maybe um, I think Moira is the person that said something that really registered in my mind. Um, thinking about them as two halves of some kind of whole, right? This idea oh, of completion, right? So there's one entity of Samuel, there's Samuelness. And Pickwick has a part of that, which is the class, but then Sam Weller is the linguistic verve. Right? And in some ways it fits to Sam Weller is always the one doing the helping and the one like making things happen. And Pickwick is always the one needing help. Exactly. So oh, yeah. I think it helps then to have that. And, and also, I love this thing that um, Irene, you were pointing to, eliding the name in both ways. So Samuel, um, Pickwick's Samuelness is elided by calling him Mr. Pickwick. And Weller's Samuelness is elided by calling him Sam. So really interesting things are happening, like with that truncation. So, so. I um, think that um, Dickens is making fun of. Um, upper classes with this whole story. I mean, oh. they're, they all have money and, and every chapter, they're so gullible, they fall for, the, they fall and get taken for their money. And um, it seems like a real class story that these silly gullible rich guys are stumbling into these situations where all of us can see the obvious that they're gonna be taken. And I like the term you use slapstick. I think it really applies to the whole tone of the book. Yeah, what do I think, you think? Um, absolutely. <laughs> and I think that's why that, that illustration by Seymour of Pickwick kicking the hat and all of the working class people around him just like laughing at him because he has, first of all, this impractical hat. Like that's not good to be out in the country with. Uh, and then all these others. So yes, Patricia, absolutely. I, it's a massive, massive, like harsh satire toward the wealthy, the elite. Christian, well, you and that's the funny thing, Christian, because as you said, this is a like a men, and it's literally a men's club, and they're supposed to be macho, and they do hunting and riding, ha ha ha. They can't even ride, and um, they do everything to be a men's club, but the whole book is making fun of the men. So it's interesting. Does anybody, all you scholars, do you know? how what the equity was on men and women reading Dickens because surely he was mostly entertaining men but I'm sure women read it well you wonder how many women actually were able to read oh, you have yeah. to understand that the education system was only put together for men to enjoy because a woman was going to get married and bring up her children and support her future husband right so it well, did behove so women to read well, but novel readers have always been uh, substantially female. And <clears throat> in this country, I know, by 1850, statistically, there was no difference in literacy between men and women, uh, white men and women. Ah. But uh, I also That's want to say, nice. apropos of the class situation, it almost makes me think of Monty Python and the upper class twits. Yes, that's exactly it. You know, where they trip over their Shoelaces, uh -huh. so to speak. Uh -huh. But she's thinking of Jeeves and Wooster. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Same. Chris, you'll know this better than I do, but it seems to me in terms of this criticism of the upper class, I seem to remember something in the preface, whoever wrote the preface, sort of indicating that that was part of the topicality of what was going on in the Pickwood papers, that at that time there were a number of scandals or, or criticisms of sort of the upper class clubs and such. Um, Drew, or any enlightenment on that or? Uh, I don't have anything beyond the general. Uh, I'm sure there's other people that specialize more in the political and social Victorian 1930s. But I, and I think, I mean, you're right. Things were changing, right? That's part of the whole um, work that's happening with Mrs. Bardell is the new woman and like increasing legal rights that are there and expressing those anxieties through Pickwick being brought into that situation. Um, so I wanna, so Dan Stewart added to the chat that um, Alcott's Little Women, they had a Pickwick Club 
right? So it's part of not like, this is the wild thing. This novel gets published and then novels start including this novel, right? So yeah. um, mm. Gaskell and Cranford early on, like there's a scene, people are playing cards and like for a topic of conversation, it's like, hey, have you read the latest Pickwick installment? Um, maybe going back to the Sam and Samuel, um, Sam Pickwick is supposed to be the leader of this group who have, you know, wild ideas about how talented they are. Sam Weller is the practical one. Like you said, Christian, you know, the two halves of the two halves make a whole. So Sam Pickwick's supposed to be the leader, but Sam Weller really is the one who gets things done. So maybe that's why they have a similar name. Yeah, that's what he said. I think so. Yeah, and later on, something is going to. Um, Sam Weller is going to write um, a Valentine, which is one of the greatest Valentines that's ever been written. But he signs it Pickwick, in another way of uh, like folding over these names and things. So keep an eye out for that moment as you're doing your reading um, for next time. More of this, these names that happen. Uh, all right, so I want to look at another character's language. So I'm going to share my slide, and that's going to be Jingle. So we talked a little bit about Weller and Wellerisms. Um, so I want to bring up Jingle and specifically uh, his first appearance. Is this it? Yes. All right. So this is a great moment thinking about, um, I think, Patricia, what you were bringing up. Pickwick thinks he can throw money at everything all the time. And so when he encounters this cabbie who's like, stop giving me this money, you betrayed my trust. And he throws the money down and wants to fight him. Pickwick doesn't know what to do. So uh, this is definitely not chapter 20. This is chapter two. Actually, <laughs> look at this. It's, ah, discard. Oh, no. No, it's, um, I am just going to change that so that then we don't have to look at the wrong thing. There we go. Uh, so Jingle, an awesome thing about him in reference to uh, what we've been talking about is we don't get his name until several, several chapters later. He appears three times before we actually get his name. So more things that are fun. And his Jingle, his, like his language itself is kind of Jingle jangly. Um, so here he comes. And there is no saying what acts of personal aggression they, the crowd, might have committed had not the fray been unexpectedly terminated by the interposition of a newcomer. So here we're thinking about people that are active. What's the fun? A beautiful first sentence. What's the fun? Said a rather tall, thin young man in a green coat emerging suddenly from the coach yard. So this is Jingle. We don't know his name yet, but I'm just using it. And then he solves things. That learned man in a few hurried words explained the real state of the case. And um, for those of you that are listening to this on the audiobook, I want you especially to be looking at what this looks like on the page. And those of you that maybe are reading it on the page, you can close your eyes while I read this and you can experience it orally. We can switch the, the moment around. Come along then, said he of the green coat, lugging Mr. Pickwick after him by main force and talking the whole way. Here, number 924, take your fare and take yourself off. Respectable gentlemen, know him well. None of your nonsense this way, sir. Where's your friends? All a mistake, I see. Never mind, accidents will happen. Best regulated families, never say die. Down on your luck, pull him up. Put that in his pipe, like the flavor, damned rascals. And with a lengthened string of similar broken sentences, delivered with extraordinary volubility, the stranger led the way to the traveler's waiting room, whither he was closely followed by Mr. Pickwick and his disciples. Here, waiter, shouted the stranger, ringing the bell with tremendous violence. Glasses round, brandy and water, hot and strong and sweet and plenty. I damaged, sir, waiter, raw beefsteak for the gentleman's eye. Nothing like a raw beefsteak for a bruise, sir. Cold lamp post, very good, but lamp post, inconvenient. Damned odd standing in the open street half an hour with your eye against a lamp post. Eh, very good, ha ha! And the stranger, without stopping to take a breath, swallowed at a draft full half a pint of the reeking brandy and water and flung himself into a chair with as much ease as if nothing uncommon had occurred. Um, so I've written here at the top that for me, this is when the novel opens. 
So people will talk about um, the novel opening with the, the first line of like the sun rises and then Pickwick comes out like the sun, but it's the emergence of jingle. This is like a language opening for me. Like the novel just suddenly, it's like, here's what it holds in store for you. Like you get through all of those like rich men bumbling around for the pleasure of a couple paragraphs like this. So I'm just curious about your impressions of Jingle. Obviously, he does some really bad things later on. So if we can think about it, maybe just like in this first initial moment, um, what do you think? What do you think about his energy, his speech patterns, how he handles himself and others? Well, I think he's clever. Okay, so another, another like kind of streetwise brainy person like Sam. He's, he's, he's an auctioneer. <laughs> Good one. Yeah, that's yeah, that, like that really that, that sharply staccato language. Um, He's very agile, physically agile, as well as being able to sum up a situation without any of the um, uh, unnecessary words or painting of pictures with language in the least, which is completely opposite from the Pickwickians, or at least uh -huh. Mr. Pickwick. Well, he has wonderful confidence and just takes over and takes charge. And knowing what we do know about him, he took one look and thought, oh, rich guys. <laughs> Let Here's me my help next meal. <laughs> yeah. It, it seems that sort of this broken sentences is sort of like a verbal sleight of hand. Like he, he would have a really hard time following the conversation if you were just sitting there. And by the time you start to figure out what he's saying, he's already like ordered food or moved you along or taken your money or something. So it seems to me that those broken sentences are a little bit of him doing his um, sort of- uh, Baffling you with his bullshit? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to put it very, 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 very bluntly, yeah. I mean, it's, it's sort of, it's, it is, but those, those short sentences that keep shifting make it difficult for anybody sitting there trying to listen, I think, to sort of follow what's going on, which is to his advantage. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. Like, it's like the, um, the magician's patter. Exactly. Yeah. He has like a stick. He's sort of like Borat in that regard. You know, he has a stick and that's it. Christian, um, so that's this interesting, is the, Cindy. Do people agree with that, that this is a, a stick or is there something else here? No, no. Pattern well, stays. Inspire trust. See it differently. Christian, the pattern stays the... fairly irregular through the book, except at the end. And at the end, though, as you'll find out if you haven't read it yet, he becomes a lot more cogent um, the last time we see him. And he still used that odd pattern of, of speech, but the thoughts become much more interconnected. What I wanted to say is that this is the passage that I chose to share when we were um, the Dickens a fellowship of Riverside uh, sharing favorite passages because this is when we were introduced to Jingle. And what I said about this passage is that this is the first time, and I said earlier that, you know, Falstaff, Jingle, Weller, it's that in this passage we get that Dickens is creating characters who give arias almost instead of just naturalistic speeches. And it reminds me very much too of Sari Gamp in. Martin Chuzzlewit, and it's just like this whole universe of what language can do to create a character who doesn't speak the way people usually do in normal life, but who these characters have such incredible life. And mm -hmm. um, I was just enchanted. Well, plus, Glenna, you know, going off on that issue about class distinctions, both Jingle and Weller, not that they're better spoken, but there's something about their communication style that's more engaging and it's indirect, but it's still, it pulls you in. And Tupman and Snodgrass, I mean, these guys are not interesting men, you know? <laughs> they just don't have the energy that Jingle and Weller bring into a room. Well, I think on a different plane, these characters are instantly recognizable. And if you're going to have a book with 50 characters, stretched out over uh, 19 months, Dickens needed to have something visual, something auditory, something unique that would help you recall who these people were. 
and he starts out at the very beginning of his career creating jingle and you will never not recognize a jingle speech if you saw it in isolation the same way you would never not recognize a sarah gamp speech or a yeah. jerry cruncher speech or any number of secondary characters it's just one of the things he did i was i two things one is that the people that dickens was writing to would be able to put into their heads the sort of accent that would be carried by jingle the english people identify people by class by their ear you can hear where they come from and the other thing is that there's a bit there put that in your pipe it's one of those sayings put that in your pipe and smoke it meaning that if you don't like it or if you do like it that's what you're going to get on with um and uh, so i was also thinking that the way that it's sort of apostrophized and and that really when you read it with with a working class accent really sort of shows how hard he's working, you know, brandy and water, elephants, blah, 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 and so on. So that it sort of shows you, you know, his characteristics. And then of course, as everybody says, once you know that's how he speaks, it's brilliant to be able to continue it like that. Yeah, and, and thank you, Vicky, for bringing up Pygmalion and My Fair Lady, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, Decades and a, a century later. But uh, can I ask Kristen another question about you, Kristen? Because when you said, when the novel opens for me, so if this was Dickens' first book and it didn't get vastly popular until Sam Weller and these illustrations all improved, but I mean, the people who read at this time, when they saw this language and this unique quality that Dickens had, do, do you think they went, you know, wow, here's somebody, like say, when Faulkner or when somebody got on the scene here in America, people looked at it and went, wow, you know, here's somebody. Do you think they had that first impression when they saw this Pickwick paper? Uh, they would have had it already before this in, in sketches, I think. Sketches oh, yeah. Those. So, um, uh, but like, so we, we will look at the opening paragraph um, because I am interested in this idea of it being so different. Like, I think that if chapter two didn't introduce Jingle and it was just like more of chapter one, um, this book would not have taken off. Yeah. So, because, um, so let's look at it. It's all one sentence and, um, where are we? All right, chapter one of the posthumous papers at the Pickwick Club. This is a very, uh, Okay. The first ray of light, which illumines the gloom and converts into a dazzling brilliancy, that obscurity in which the earlier history of the public career of the immortal Pickwick would appear to be involved, is derived from the perusal of the following entry in the transactions of the Pickwick Club, which the editor of these papers feels the highest pleasure in laying before his readers as a proof of the careful attention, indefatigable assiduity, and nice discrimination with which his search among the multifarious documents confided to him has been conducted. <laughs> so impression, what do you guys think when you encounter this? He doesn't like periods. Okay, he doesn't like periods, Dan, <laughs> right. Yeah, it is a most impressive oh, first sentence. Um, oh, I can't. Very presumptuous and... Um, yeah. That's what I think. Like we're supposed to be really impressed with this impressive sentence. Yeah. I like it. It flows beautifully. It sure does. <laughs> I, I think I, I agree with all of that, especially like the lack of periods in it. I think of this as it's delving into the world of a fraternal organization, or in this case, it's a men's club, like as an outsider, who gives a damn? But the insiders, the people who are actually members of these things, it, it's a big deal. So it's very officious sounding, and it's, it's treating this as if this were serious, serious stuff. The Pickwick Club is very, very important and serious. Uh, so the language motivates that. 
That's right. Yeah, that's really interesting. That well, like secret knowledge that you have access to because of this. Well, and the, well, adjectives, the adjectives are charming. There, it's you know, uppity but but uppity. charming. Uh, the dazzling brilliancy, and the immortal Pickwick, um, and the high. He has the high honor uh, of being able to be the editor of these papers, and the highest pleasure. Uh, and indefatigable. Yeah, indefat <laughs> indefatigable. That's the less Yeah. So anyway, nice. Well, uh, plus, uh, following on to that, you have ray of light, illumining gloom, dazzling brilliancy. That's referencing, you know, bringing it out into obscurity, and then he says, you know, this transaction, which is below. And the next thing below this, um, these minutes, they're so dull and dry. <laughs> and, um, you know, speculations on the source of the Hampstead bonds with the observations on the theory of tittlebats. There's no way that's going to raise to the level of dazzling brilliancy. <laughs> Although, Nora, the way you said that made it, I think it's the funniest it's ever been to me. <laughs> okay. I was like, yeah. That's <laughs> Well, of course, by now you realize his someone's tongue is in someone's cheek. Right. Yeah, I yeah. think you need to read a few more sentences before you get a sense of how sarcastic Dickens is <laughs> in this particular, in his beginning. Yeah. I, I'd like to say it's kind of a hook because the first mm -hmm. famous paragraph of A Tale of Two Cities is all one sentence. Yes. And the reader is going to pick it up uh, at a book stall somewhere and not feel he can stop until he reaches the first period. So I've always thought this was a, <laughs> just a sales te technique on Dickens' part. He's hoping well, to hook you in that long first sentence. <laughs> we're, we're reading Faulkner right now. We're reading Absalom, Absalom, if you want to talk about sentences that never yes. pause right. and never, and yet it's really like re reading poetry. You cannot just read for action. It's like reading poetry. So it really slows it down so you can feel the rhythm. That's funny, Sita, that I just met him. Because I mean, I think when you saw him, you go, this is really something. And as that's what you do when you see Dickens. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So uh, another word that I think here, like, so the light, I think is really important, but this idea of pleasure is uh, it's also there. And this is like an anxiety that Dickens is always going to have with his readership is it's like, <laughs> are they enjoying it? Like, do we have a relationship of like fraternity and like pleasure? And so the more you can find there, um, like, and that's one of the things like why it's important to have a Pickwick club like this or any kind of book group is you want to talk about these things, right? Because if you think something is cool and enjoyable, it's so much more so when you can share it with somebody else and hear right. that they also enjoy it. In a sense, Christian, is it like a, a big tease, this first paragraph? A big team? Tease, T-E-A-S-E. -E. Um, I'm not sure. Sita, you're muted if you're talking. The two footnotes, <laughs> which explain the um, initials after the names, that really, you know, makes you feel this is a big farce, uh, and that's ridiculous, and it's also charming. You know, I mean, presumptuous and charming, ridiculous and charming. <laughs> You know, the perpetual vice president, member Pickwick Club, yeah. or the general chairman, Samuel, is the general chairman, member Pickwick Club. Um, I hadn't made this connection before, uh, but if, you, if any of you have read Calvin and Hobbes, um, Calvin and Hobbes have their club, Gross, and they're always coming up with elaborate names of perpetual dictator for life. And, oh. Uh, like that. <laughs> that's kind of, yeah. Right. This is great. Um, I like that we're talking about this because you're helping me see it in a different way. Um, so the other opening is okay. So just so you, people know, this is kind of um, like as a riff as well on Genesis. Like oh. in the beginning was the the word, and then God says, "Let there be light." And so we have like a creation <laughs> pattern that's happening here. 
and we're converting things. So we're, we're making transformation, we're separating um, different groups. There's like a, a strong kind of idea of Genesis. Um, and then we are gonna mythologize Pickwick in a little bit. That punctual servant of all work, the sun had just risen and begun to strike a light on the morning of the 13th of May, 1827, which is 10 years before this book is being written. When Mr. Samuel Pickwick burst like another sun from his slumbers, threw open his chamber window and looked out upon the world beneath. Goswell Street was at his feet. Goswell Street was on his right hand. As far as the eye could reach, Goswell Street extended on his left and the opposite side of Goswell Street was over the way. Such, thought Mr. Pickwick, are the narrow views of these philosophers who, content with examining the things that lie before them, look not to the truths which are hidden beyond. <laughs> and then he gets his telescope and his notebook and he sallies forth. Oh, this is real virtue. This is real philosophy. This is spiritual teaching. Uh, can you say more, Sita, about what you mean? Well, you know, of course, the, um, not of course, but the sp spiritual philosophy is aimed at inviting people into uh, a contemplation of their, if not their inner world, their outer world, which is where Pickwick is, science, for instance. Um, and uh, he's commenting on the shallowness. Well, he, they're philosophers, aren't they? They're shallow because they just look at the road ahead. They don't look at the underpinnings of any situation. I mean, I think they do, but that's what he's commenting on. And he's going out to better man, mankind. I mean, that's his mission. And he's doing it through observation. And so I think he's teaching us to see. <laughs> yeah, are other people finding um, Pickwick to be a philosopher? <laughs> I think uh, it's more like Zarathustra waking up in the morning to the sunrise and seeing oh. all before him. So I, that's the first thought I had. So I was wondering if Nietzsche maybe had, had read, so, read this before. <laughs> Oh, I, I see it again as, as this case, without his awareness, once again, he's, I don't want to call him a fool, but, you know, he, he does not measure up to the dignity and all the um, uh, accolades that, that he's presented all, all the book long, you know, but I mean, it's like he sees more deeply than philosophers, you know, so I don't, I don't know that he does. He's more generous, though. He's a better person. Yeah, and I think thinking about his generosity will be interesting because it kind of begins as a monetary generosity. And like he kind of thinks if he throws, he can throw money at the world. So this is one of my problems with Pickwick is he is a rich white man who the world is designed to allow access to these places. And so he can go to places that the lower class can. But like when, for instance, Jingo borrows Winkle's coat to go to that ball, that's an infiltration that results in like a challenge to a duel. Uh, and so there's, there's a level of privilege with Pickwick with which I am left uncomfortable because of like how unconsciously he moves through the world. When he, when he gets that sentence that um, Mrs. Bardell is suing him, he says, everybody is inconvenienced, but I'm the most inconvenienced person that's ever been inconvenienced. Uh, well, well, I think there's a certain disingenuous Cindy, you muted yourself. Okay, Cindy, I don't know if you know you muted yourself. I, I said, I think it's disingenuous because this is mostly read by men and it's making fun of men, but ha ha, are we supposed to think that men really made fun of themselves? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> sure they do. No, not then, not now, no. <laughs> So, I would be interested to know whether, whether you think this was Dickens' own view of that P, of P of, of Pickwick, the idea that uh, he was 
criticizing his level of privilege or feeling of privilege or whether Dickens himself would have shared that privilege and not maybe even been aware that he was writing that way. Yeah, so what's interesting about this point in his life is he's barely emerging from poverty at this point. He's scraping by like foot to mouth. At, oh. this time, at the moment when he begins writing Pickwick, he doesn't have enough money to get married. So it's like he has mm -hmm. to hold off his wedding to Catherine. Uh, he's going to, in the course of Pickwick, be writing Pickwick, editing Bentley's mis Miscellany, and starting Oliver Twist. Like he's And then writing journalism and criticism on the side. He is massively overworked as he tries to get money. Of course, by the end of Pickwick, he'll be an international bestseller. And like, like he writes himself into the class that he's mocking at the beginning. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then in David Copperfield, he, <laughs> he can't avoid it. Well, he certainly at least had the intelligence that maybe all of his readers did not to get the satire on both sides of it, you know. Uh, you know, he can appreciate it from either side. I think uh, so the Pitwickians don't mind the satire because they don't realize that uh, they're being taken down or made fun of because they're so sincere in yeah. their in their end product, in the path they're going to take, that they don't see it as amusing. That's how brilliant to me Dickens is because he makes it funny because the characters within that see it as them being perfectly middle-class and, and doing things that gentlemen do. Yeah, rightly so in a sense, yeah. Uh, excellent. So the last passage that I had kind of prepared for us to talk about is the scene with Mrs. Bardell. Oh, that's brilliant. So it's clear. what I had this planned might not actually work as well as I was hoping because I just have it. it. It's more text than I'm used to, so I didn't make a special slide for it. So I'm just going to share the Gutenberg screen, which will look very familiar to those of you that are reading it on Gutenberg. Um, and, uh, Reader view available. <laughs> <laughs> is, that a, is, that a, is that a Gutenberg button? Button. Yep, it's the A, oh. three different sizes. It's up at the top. Reader view. A drop down will come. No, maybe. I don't see it on your screen actually. Let me. Uh, uh, oh, up top, up top, up top, oh. top, top, up, up, up. Up here? No, 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 no. Just up above that even maybe. No, that's as high as my screen goes. You can pull it down. I can go to about, search and browse, and help. Um, I'll just zoom in on this. Okay. I can do that. Okay. All right, Mrs. Bardell. Look at all the times your name appears, Mrs. Bardell, here in chapter 12. Oh. All right. Mm. That. Let's see, now I can do this. Um, is that a little bit better? Better, better, yeah. Okay. And we can do the same thing on our yeah. own screen. This is, chapter, this is chapter 12, it's the beginning of chapter 12. So we could all just be looking at it that way as well, rather than sharing the screen. And what might be fun, I think, is if we can have two people that would be willing to act out this scene. So I'll read the narrative, but starting here where I'll, I'll introduce us to this little moment where it says Mrs. Bardell. So we need a Pickwick to read there, and then we need a Mrs. Bardell to read, and we'll just go through this little little exchange. Is there somebody that has a copy available to read as Pickwick? Oh, come on, guys and gals. <laughs> I, haven't read, I haven't read this far, so I'm not gonna volunteer, although I'd love to read it. I don't mind reading if it's in front of me. Perfect. <laughs> uh, Vicky, are you getting your copy out? I don't know where I'd find it, to be honest. Oh, okay. Chapter 12. Yes, it's just the writing's very small, so it would take me half an hour to know where chapter 12 was. That's the librarian's revenge. Yes, <laughs> I deserve it. <laughs> um, yeah, help me, David. Sorry. Linda, would you be willing to be a reader? 
if you kept that up, I could read it. Oh, do, oh, do. <laughs> so if you wanted, I could read it while it's up there. Lovely. Yeah. Good. I'd be happy to try Pitwick. All right. So we have a Pitwick with Stephen. Uh -huh. and, who, and where are we going to start exactly? Uh, I'm um, going to start by reading It Was Evident. And then your first words will be Mrs. Bardell said Mr. P and I'll read the narrative. Okay. So you and guys, it'll be like an, a play then. I'll do my best. All It'll right, so fun. we have Victoria and Stephen, mm -hmm. chapter 12, here we go. It was evident that something of great importance was in contemplation, but what that something was, not even Mrs. Bardell had been able to discover. Mrs. Bardell, said Mr. Pickwick at last, as that amiable female approached the termination of a prolonged dusting of the apartment. Your little boy, that's mine. Oh, you so sorry. Okay. Someone say, say, sir. Uh. <laughs> Your little boy is very long time gone. Why, it's a good long way to the borough, sir. Remonstrated, uh. Mrs. Bardell. Uh. <laughs> said Mr. Pickwick. Very, very true, so it is. Mr. Pickwick relapsed into silence, and Mrs. Bardell resumed her dusting. Mrs. Bardell said Mr. Pickwick at the expiration of a few minutes. Do you think, no, no, sir, sir, that's sir. your, sorry, yeah, that's what I thought, sorry. Uh, do you think it much greater expense to keep two people than to keep one? I'm lost now. Now I'm lost. Uh, la, oh. Mr. Pickwick. La, Mr. Pickwick, said Mrs. Bardell, coloring up to the very border of her cap, as she fancied she observed a species of matrimonial twinkle in the eyes of her lodger. La, Mr. Pickwick, what a question. That's good. <laughs> well, do you? Inquired Mr. Pickwick. That depends, said Mrs. Bardell, approaching the duster very near to Mr. Pickwick's elbow, which was planted on the table. That depends a good deal upon the person you know, Mr. Pickwick. <laughs> whether it's a saving <laughs> careful person. <laughs> That's very true, said Mr. But Pickwick. The I, uh, but the person I have in my eye, here he looked very hard at Mrs. Bardell, I think possesses these qualities and has moreover a considerable knowledge of the world and a great deal of sharpness, Mrs. Bardell, which may be of material use to me. Ah, <laughs> Mr. Pickwick, <laughs> <laughs> said Mrs. Bardell, the crimson rising to her cap border again. I do, said Mr. Pickwick, growing energetic, as was his wont in speaking of a subject which interested in him. I do indeed, and to tell you the truth, Mrs. Bardell, I have made up my mind. Oh, dear me, sir, <laughs> exclaimed Mrs. Bardell. Into it. I think it's very strange now said the amiable Mr. Pickwick, with a good-humoured glance at his companion. That I never co consulted you about this matter, and never ever mentioned it, till I sent your little boy out this morning, huh? Mrs. Bardell could only reply by a look. She had long worshipped Mr. Pickwick at a distance, but here she was, all at once, raised to a pinnacle to which her wildest and most extravagant hopes had never dared to aspire. Mr. Pickwick was going to propose oh. a deliberate plan, too. <laughs> Sent her little boy to the burrow to get him out of the way. How thoughtful, how considerate. Well, what do you think? I've lost my place in this, I'm sorry. So kind, is it here? Thank it's you. just oh, before that. Yeah, I, oh, Mr. Pickwick, said Mrs. Bardell, trembling with agitation. Oh, you're very kind, sir. Well, I'll <laughs> save you a great, a good deal of trouble, wouldn't it? said Mr. Pickwick. Oh, I never thought anything of the trouble, sir, replied Mrs. Bardell. A and of course, I should take more trouble to please you than, than ever. But it's so kind of you, Mr. Pickwick, to have so much consideration for my loneliness. Ah, to be sure, Aww. said Mr. Pickwick. I never <laughs> thought of that. <laughs> when I'm in town, you always have somebody to sit with, you know, to be sure, so you will. 
I, I am sure I ought to be a, a very happy woman, said Mrs. Bardell. <laughs> and your boy, said Mr. Pickwick. Isn't it? And your boy, said Mr. Pickwick. And your, and your little boy, said Mr. Pickwick. Bless his heart, interposed Mrs. Bardell with a maternal sob. Oh, <laughs> he's, he, he'll too have a companion. Oh, that's Mr. Pickwick. Pickwick. Yeah, he too will have a companion, a lively one, who will teach him. I'll be bound more than tricks a week that he would ever learn in a year. And Mr. Pickwick smiled placidly. Oh, you are a dear, said Mrs. Bardell. Mr. <laughs> Pickwick started. Oh, you kind. Oh, that's what Mr. No, Pickwick. That's what Mrs. Kind, good, oh, oh, you kind, good, oh, playful Mrs. dear. Oh. That's her. Okay. That's, that's oh, Bardell. That was me, sorry. Oh, you kind, good, playful dear, said Mrs. Bardell. And without more ado, she rose from her chair, flung her arms around Mr. Pickwick's neck with a cataract of tears and a chorus oh. of um, <laughs> bless, bless my soul, cried the astonished Mr. Pickwick. Mrs. Bardell, my good woman, dear me, what a situation. Pray consider. Mrs. Bardell, don't. Oh. If anybody should come. Oh, let them come, exclaimed Mrs. Bardell frantically. I'll never leave you, dear, kind, good soul. And, and with these words, Mrs. Bardell clung the tighter. Mercy upon me, said Mr. Pickwick, struggling violently. I hear somebody coming up the stairs. Don't, don't, there's, there's a good creature, don't. But entreaty and remonstrance were alike unavailing, for Mrs. Bardell had fainted in Mr. Pickwick's arms, oh. and before he could gain time to deposit her on a chair, Master Bardell entered the room, ushering in Mr. Tupman, Mr. Winkle, and Mr. Snodgrass. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. Uh, <laughs> marvelous, marvelous wait, work. Wait, wait. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm re I'm used to reading Shakespeare, so I I forget about your little uh, narrative to, to come in there. Yeah, uh, those tags. Um, so we have been here for. I'm not sure how the time works. Um, if it's a hard out at five, your time, whatever time it is where you guys are. It's a hard out. I think it's a hard out. Okay. <laughs> But it's been wonderful. Oh my God, this is exciting. Oh, so thank exciting. You. Yeah. So you have that to look forward to. Yeah. Thank you so much, Christian. You were really great. This was a great one. Yes, you back. Awesome. It was very great to see all of you. Thank you. Thank, nice thank you so much. Thank you. We'll see everybody in a month, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. yes. Can somebody find out why they drink brandy and water? Because I don't know anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> You drink it. You drink your brandy straight, Cindy. Absolutely. <laughs> no. Is it, do they dilute it because it needs it, or because it uh, uh, lengthen the time they have it? Oh, water oh. makes brandy stronger. Oh. Oh. Okay. Hmm. And then it lasts longer too. So, oh, it yeah. makes it stronger. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm. You know, you take a you take a little bit of uh, water into a scotch, for instance. And it just, it transmutes it. It really does. The vapors start coming up and oh. not know anything about that. Yeah, but <laughs> of course not. <laughs> I'm not hugging Mr. Pickwick. <laughs> okay. Okay. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks, so Thanks, Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. I'll Thanks send an email out with information of, about the next meeting. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, thank you.